Welcome to Next Level Healing. I'm your host, Dr. Tara Perry. For 25 years, I've helped professionals, first responders, celebrities, Olympians, teachers, moms, dads, and people just like you achieve their results better and faster than they thought possible. This is where measurable modern science meets the quantum. We're so glad you're here. Let's dive right in. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Next Level Healing. I'm your host, Dr. Tara Perry. Today we have with us Rick Archer. I'm so happy he's joining us. Rick is the creator and the host of the interview show Buddha at the Gas Pump. Since the fall of 2009, he has interviewed nearly 700 spiritually awakened people from the well-known to the unknown, from a variety of backgrounds and traditions. His YouTube channel has over 100,000 subscribers and nearly 19 million views. Rick learned Transcendental Meditation in 1968 when he was 18. He was trained by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi as a TM teacher in 1970 and served in that capacity for 25 years, teaching hundreds of people, lecturing around the world, and helping to train TM teachers. He earned bachelor's and master's degrees in Vedic studies from Maharishi International University. Rick is no longer associated with the TM organization, having become too eclectic and independent in his perspective to affiliate exclusively with any one organization. Welcome to Next Level Healing, Rick Archer. Thank you, Tara. <laughs> Rick is out on his morning walk, which I think is so great that somebody can uh, so easily incorporate uh, being with nature, getting exercise, because we're all so busy these days. Rick, you have been reaching um, so many people uh, that are wanting to up-level their spiritual life, um, and you've done uh, an amazing job of this. Um, and in an age when TikTok and Instagram have taken off and people have very, very short uh, attention spans, you've thrived uh, with this very long format. Your interviews are very deep, very engaging, and can go on for a couple of hours. What do you think is the biggest key to your success? Hmm, a couple hours. I must cater to the old people, huh? <laughs> I actually do get, you know, inquiring from apparently younger people saying, can't you do really short ones, like a minute? And <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually in the process of, of working on creating shorts, which have become a thing, you know, little nuggets, little excerpts. And, but I'm still going to do the long one because I really like, uh, I like the interviews to be as comprehensive and deep as possible. And even an hour feels like we haven't covered it, you know? So the key to the success, I don't know. I think I just found a niche that um, appeals to, you know, a lot of people these days. Um, and the diversity of my guests kind of reflect my own psychology or my own outlook. I, I kind of try to take a, a God's eye view of things in, in terms of all the different, well, you could put it this way, that there are 8.05 billion paths to, to God or to higher, you know, higher realization, as many as there are people in the world. And so any, any sense that any one path is exclusively true or the best or anything like that um, is, I can't relate to it. And, you know, I, so I, I'm very comfortable talking to a great diversity of people and tuning into their particular perspective. Love it. Uh, it was funny. I got a nudge this morning. Uh, I, I wanted to sneak in going to the gym, which I did. Um, and uh -huh. it's so funny when you get that spiritual nudge, it was like my conscious mind was saying, you don't have time. My, my, my true self was saying, uh, you need to go to the gym. Uh, so I did. Uh -huh. Of course, I parked next to my neighbor who I had texted yesterday about something that was important. Uh, long story. But uh, anyway, I, 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 of course, parked right next to him and I had sent the number to the wrong person. So he didn't get it. So the universe wanted me to be there. And then, of course, on my way back, this is hilarious, Rick, you'll like this. Um, one of my new favorite authors who you've interviewed a couple of times, Mark Gober, um, I was listening uh -huh. to his book, An End to Upside Down Liberty. And of course, as I'm listening to the book, he references your show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's been on a couple of times. Um, one, with regard to his book, uh, The End to Upside Down Thinking, and then 
the end to upside down contact more recently where he's covered the UFO topic. Yeah. I, I think it's so um, wonderfully eye opening. Um, his his book, An Unto Upside Down uh, Thinking, was uh, just like brain folding to me. And, and I know to you because I had heard in one of your shows you were talking about um, the movie Close Encounters and, oh, yeah. uh, and how all these people were like driven to to connect uh, even though they didn't know, you know, Richard Dreyfus with his mashed potato pile, they're not understanding, <laughs> driven to do this, right? Right. This means something. This means something. Yes. So can you... For those who haven't seen the movie, I, oh, go ahead, what are you going to ask? No, no, go ahead. Tell, tell, the, tell what the, for those who haven't seen the oh, movie. Well, the movie, to me, the movie is like an allegory for the spiritual path because, you know, Richard Dreyfus and other people in the movie got implanted with a, an impulse or some kind of thing from the UFO people, uh, but, but it sort of like tagged them. And once they were tagged, they couldn't, they couldn't stop. They couldn't rest. They had to find what it was that was driving them. And the whole society was against them. You know, Richard Dreyfuss, his wife thought he was crazy. Um, everybody else, the government set up a whole thing to prevent anybody from getting near Devil Tower, which is where the aliens were going to land. And, uh, but they just kind of carried on despite all the resistance from the society and their environment. And then Richard Grice was ultimately was the guy who made it all the way and got on the spaceship. But I think that, um, Christopher Lightning is like that because so many things in our society and in our own perception try to convince us that it's not possible. There is no such thing. There aren't these higher dimensions or realities or, you know, deeper deeper experiences that one can have. And uh, I just got implanted myself in, in that way when I was 17 and I couldn't forget it. And it just kind of, it eventually got me out of a year of drug abuse and onto the meditation path. And I've just been kettled to the metal ever since. Would you tell us about that experience when you were 17? Because I'm again, this concept of being pulled to a bigger truth um, I think is um, kind of where it's at. Uh, I feel like I've been on that path as as well as all of your, you know, um, hundreds um, of listeners and uh, millions of viewers, uh, you know, they, they're they seeking something. Um, and in Mark Dover's case, when he found people like you, uh, it transformed him out of being a materialist, uh, which he was very successful at being, but was very unfulfilling. Um, and catapulted him into writing books on multiple categories, which I think are mind blowing. Uh, but but tell us about your journey when you were seventeen. Sure. Okay. Now I'm climbing a hill, so I'm going to breathe a little heavily. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, so I was. I grew up in a rather troubled family. My father was a professional artist and was severely impacted by World War II, and certainly had PTSD. And he was an alcoholic and verbally abusive, and my mother ended up trying to commit suicide three times and in and out of mental hospitals during my adolescence. Um, and anyway, I kind of had moved out of the house when I was about 14, and I was hanging out with this very permissive family where we could smoke and drink and take drugs when drugs came along. And I was a drummer, played in the rock and roll band, had a lot of fun. But by the time I was 17, well, during my 17th and 18th year, I dropped out of high school, got arrested a couple times for drugs. And by the end of that year, I was really a mess. You know, my life was you know, it's bottomed out. And so, but I had, been, I had realized the year prior that enlightenment was a thing. You know? I had read Timothy Leary in an Alpert book on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And, uh, you know, taking out of Day, hoping it would provide spiritual insight. But it's the one night after about a year of that, I was high on some listening to gym and I was sitting in the basement of my father's house in my bedroom, reading a Zen book just because I couldn't sleep and I wanted to study my, study my mind. And I thought, as I read, I thought, wow, these guys are really serious, were really serious, and I'm just screwing around. And if I keep screwing around like this, I'm going to live a miserable life. I probably won't live a very long life. And so I thought, well, that's it. I'm going to stop taking drugs. 
I never learned that no meditation was the only thing I was aware of at the time. And uh, I'll see what happened. So I did, and my life turned around very quick. So very, before long, I was back in school, had a job, was getting along very with my father. Within a couple of years, I became a teacher, and, and so on and so forth. So anyway, um, hopefully I answered your question. I don't want to go too long on any one question, but uh, perhaps you have a, another question. No, no, you're doing great. And I appreciate that because um, it is interesting how, mm, how, how we can transition out of being so lost and so miserable um, by, by connecting to that. Um, I'm actually, TM was my first introduction. Uh, uh-huh. one, of, one of the earliest introductions I had, I, I would say I can remember two. Uh, um, one of them was reading Barbara Marciniak's book, The Bringers of the Dawn. And I, I suddenly took a, a huge sigh of relief and I thought, oh my goodness, I, I, I now have a feeling like I know why I'm here because I, I would look around at the human race and I would think, goodness, is this really, you know, is this representative of, of what I am? <laughs> you know, I sit yeah. in wars and torturing and, and, and being immensely cruel to animals and it's like, mm-hmm. seriously, is this the best of what we as a species have to offer? Um, and so when I read that book, I thought, okay, now I have an inkling as to why I'm here. Um, I, I had a sense of, of having a bigger purpose. Um, and then I did a, um, somebody, uh, did the TM breath work with me. Um, and, um, I, I had sort of an Eckhart Tolle experience where I, uh, you know, you go, you kind of just completely go out into the universe and, stuff connects. And, uh, I, I, I was like seeing auras for the next three weeks and I was in such a place <laughs> peace. This was crazy. Um, I had just come back from a year in China. I was studying acupuncture there. Um, and, uh, I, uh, I was in such a state of peace that I thought, my goodness, if I don't, if I don't start to feel uncomfortable, I'm never going to get anything done with my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and it lasted about three weeks. And then I was able to sort of reassemble, you know, uh, the, the three dimensional sense of progress and get back into my program and, um, and finish up. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, uh, and again, you talk about the allegory and, uh, I used to read scripts for a living and it was apparent to me. Um, in fact, I came to the, a, a very famous producer at one point, um, and just because of stuff I had written about a script that they were interested in doing. And I and I spoke of it from an allegorical point of view because I could see the Star Wars, you know, uh, Star Trek, all these these stories were were connecting with people and people were, you know, there's some part of our DNA that goes, wait a minute, there's something true about that. And so when you're having all these conversations with people that are having these awakenings, um, I think that's why, I mean, it just seems as an observer that that's resonating with people on a, on a super deep level. And, um, you know, I love listening to your shows and I love the diversity of people that you, you pick and choose from and, and the different things that I learn from different people and different backgrounds and walks of life. I mean, one of your recent interviews with, with was with somebody who had um, grown up in a Japanese internment camp. Oh yeah. Kranti Ananta. I think. Yeah. And he, yeah. You know, this was a, this was a man. Um, oh, and, man. Okay. and he was, uh, uh also very disturbed and, and, uh, had an alcohol issue and severe anger issues and, and, and uh, him getting over, he, he's the one that talked about reaching a new level of forgiveness. Um, he, he not only had to forgive himself and his actual abusers in the internment camp, but he, he ended up taking it a whole new level and forgiving himself for the war. <laughs> But he must have been old, whoever you're talking about, to if he was in the war or alive uh, during the war. He, he, was, he, was brought, back. Yep. he was raised in an internment camp. Uh, and so he saw a lot of abuse of the women there, um, you yeah. know, uh, his mother and the other women there. Um, so, so he just had enormous amounts of anger and frustration. But um, to see how, how his life completely changed by that extraordinary level of forgiveness was so... Um, heartwarming and inspiring. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, sometimes these things happen like uh, maybe five, 10 years ago, some gunman came in and shot up a whole bunch of Amos kids in, in Pennsylvania in a school or Amos community. And immediately the Amos people were, you know, forgiving him and baking pies for his family and all kinds of stuff. And I thought, 
oh my God, could I do that? Um, <laughs> and did they really forgive him or is this just sort of a traditional thing that you have to go through the motions? It, it was hard for me to, to fathom, but it's a beautiful thing if one can do it. And uh, I suppose it um, is an indication of, you know, faith in a higher reality and perhaps also a great degree of degree of flexibility and, you know, tendency to not get entrenched in, in resentment or grudges and eat stuff. I once reached out to my spiritual uh, teacher, my meditation teacher. Uh, he went into prison and found enlightenment in prison. And now he, 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 re, he for years went into prisons and taught prisoners uh, meditation uh, because, hmm. well, that's a long story. But um, I'm thinking either Kenny Johnson or Satyam Nadine. Uh, he, he wrote. He wrote a. He wrote a book called um, 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 "Maximum Security." It's a play on words, and his name is Alan. Uh, he he's not well known, but his story could certainly be a, a movie, uh, a feature film. Yep. It's, he he was basically the Wolf of Wall Street, uh, not the guy, but somebody just like him. Uh, he. Um, uh, goodness, uh, he, he, he ended up getting, uh, busted on 93 counts of securities fraud. <laughs> wow. Um, uh, he was such a slick guy that he and his partner talked themselves out of a prison sentence. Uh, but then he, uh, had to, uh, I'm trying to make this as short as possible. Uh, he ended up getting busted on a, on a cocaine charge, uh, cause he had to make money, uh, cause he couldn't do the securities thing anymore. Uh, right. and, and he ends up going to prison, uh, early on in the prison experience, he is running around a track terrified because he's a little Jewish guy in a maximum security New York prison. Um, right. and, yeah, I mean, it's terrified and through grace, he, he found somebody that protected him. Uh, but he also experienced enlightenment. Um, and that was the prison project, uh, city yoga. And uh, he ended up developing a macrobiotic diet. He transformed the prison and ended up being one of four people in the entire state of New York to re receive a full pardon. Actually, he'd be a good guest for your show. I can introduce you guys. <laughs> yeah, send me an email about him. Um, um, but so, you, know, you mentioned the word enlightenment. I just want to comment on that briefly. Um, you know, when I first started this show, the subtitle of it was Interviews with Spiritually Awakened People. And then it just got uncomfortable because the term awakened was too static and ultimate. And, and you know, so we changed it eventually to, and also I, they were conversations. So we changed it to conversations with spiritually awakening people. Mm. And I have a lot of conversations with people about what enlightenment is, whether it is. Um, and my conclusion is that if we're going to use the word at all, and we should use it rarely, and it would mean some kind of very holistic development where not only had a person sort of realized their absolute dimension, you know, pure consciousness, the self, whatever, but they had well developed personality and all of this other aspect. Um, Ken Wilber has a, has a notion of lines of development. And, you know, he, when I first, when I was teaching KM, we used to say that all these different lines of development that we have within us are co correlated. So if you're developing consciousness, all the other ones are going to come along. Like, you know, if you pull one leg of a table, the others will come along. Or if you water the root of a tree, all the leaves will flourish. But I just haven't seen evidence for that over the years. I mean, there's been some, but I've come to conclude that the correlation is rather loose, like a big stretchy rubber band. And that one can apparently have had quite a profound awakening in consciousness and yet be, you know, a sexual abuser or financial swindler or, you know, addicted to some substances or various other things, as we've seen so many examples of in spiritual community. So I hesitate to use the word enlightenment. I, I think we're all works in progress. Um, St. Teresa of Avila said that it appears that God himself is on the journey. Uh, so I think, I think it's safer to think of oneself as always being capable of messing up, you know, of going off the rails and to, to exercise care and scrutiny and um, self-attentiveness as, as one goes through life. I'll, I'll end with a quick quote from 
Pagnuson Baba, the ancient Buddhist sage, he said, although my awareness is as vast as the sky, my attention to karma is as fine as a grain of barley. Karma means action. And what that would mean is that, you know, he's saying, hey, I'm pretty cosmic, but I have to really be careful of mind my T's and Q's because it doesn't matter how cosmic I am, I could go off, you know, I could make mistakes. So I have to be careful. I love that. I'm so glad you're saying that because I, in my life, I feel like I've had so many moments of spontaneous, uh, I don't know what you call it, awakening and light, um, where everything is just so clear and so beautiful and so connected and so loving and so, wow. <laughs> and, the, and then, you know, 3D sneaks back in again and it's like, how do you talk back and forth uh, between the two? Um, do you remember the scene in... Um, uh, Lord of the Rings, where the female character uh, gets all puffed up with power, uh, and she's the feels like she's all all powerful and capable of anything, and and then she exhales and 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 says, "Oh my gosh, thank God I passed the test." Oh yeah, I I, I, I vaguely remember that scene, but that, that's really a, an archetype, I think, because you know the bigger they are, the harder they fall, and I and there there's a whole thing called um, what is it called? Spiritual ego or something that some people talk about where you have a significant spiritual awakening, but it goes to your head, you know? You you get a sense of self-importance or aggrandizement. And I've seen it, and it, very often it happens, a lot of these things happen incrementally. They don't happen in an instant. And so they sneak up on you and you don't realize that they're doing so. So... You know, and it often happens because of the adulation that a spiritual teacher experiences. You know, he, he or she sitting there up on the stage, everybody is ogling and googling over them and making a big fuss about them. And it, it sort of uh, incrementally expands the ego. And they become, they, they think they're pretty hot stuff. And, and then, you know, very often they end up misbehaving sometimes quite egregiously. Um, oh, I just want to add in one point. You said like a few minutes ago that when you first learned to meditate, you had you were seeing auras for three weeks, but you couldn't get anything done. Um, I think a key point is integration. Um, we can have all kinds of profound experiences, but then they needn't necessarily incapacitate us, but they have to be integrated. So a person could be, you know, very profoundly enlightened state, and yet be a brain surgeon or a 747 pilot or, you know, doing something very challenging. And it, it, not only is he not um, incapacitated by his spiritual state, but it, his skills or her skills are actually enhanced by it. Mm. Um, but it has, to, it has to be integrated. Right. No, I think the spiritual uh, path and enlight uh, well enlightenment, whatever phase that you want to call it, def definitely does enhance your world living abilities. Um, or ass assum assuming that what you're doing is in alignment, I think if you're doing something that's not in alignment, then that tends to fall away. Yeah, I incidentally, uh, about five six years ago, I helped establish an organization called the. Association for Spiritual Integrity. And that came about because I gave a talk at one of the science and non-duality conferences about the ethics of enlightenment, which is on bad death, the same very much to see it. And afterward, I had lunch with Jack O'Keefe and John Prendergast and Craig Holiday. We, we had this conversation and decided to start an organization. And now that organization is going pretty well. We have 550 members, about 25 member organizations. We gave a presentation at Harvard Divinity School in April um, in a conference about this kind of thing, about the importance of, of ethics in, in, on the in spiritual community. We presented at the Parliament of World Religion in Chicago last month, and we have all kinds of plans and initiatives. So I just wanted to throw that in. Uh, I've just become to feel very strongly about the importance of ethics on the spiritual path because I've seen so many train wrecks and so many yeah. people harmed by, by unethical teachers. Yeah, and one more time, so people that are on the path that are looking for spiritual integrity, where can they go to get some of that information? 
Yeah, it's called the Association for Spiritual Integrity, which will come up number one if you Google it. Yes, and the URL is, the URL is spiritual-integrity.org. Beautiful. Um, so, Rick, you started the show um, um, 14 years ago, and uh, how would you say the hunger uh, from your audience has changed over time? Uh, what it, when did you first notice that people that you were filling a gap that was really needed? Um, and and how has that changed over that 14 years? Well, it's funny. When I first conceived of it, I was out in the garage working out on a boat like scene, listening to some Adya Shanti audios. And I thought, I should, I should start an interview show. In fact, I had been participating in this little local thought song for quite a few years. And uh, no, no particular year. We just all sat around and had a beautiful discussion once a week. And I would... We were supposed to, the, the ground rule was we were supposed to talk about our own experiences, but I would find myself probing people and interviewing people. And the, the, the guy who was living room, we were having and kept saying, stop interviewing people. So, so finally it dawned on me, I should be interviewing people. So um, I got the idea to do this. And I initially conceived of it as a radio show on my little local radio station with a 10 mile radius. You can see that on, on that gap, the first interview I did. And but then they didn't want to do it. And so I was kind of grumbling and waiting and trying to convince them. And finally, some friends said, why are you thinking so small? You know, get this out on the internet, make it bigger. And so I started recording the shows at a local public access TV station and did a bunch of those. And then a good, my high, one of my best friends at high school volunteered to do the video post production. And all of a sudden I had 18 shows that I could put on the internet. So I had to figure out how to create a, you know, the website and YouTube channel and all that stuff. And one thing led to the next and started catching on pretty quickly. Um, and, uh, there were, there are some things that are somewhat similar, like Jeffrey Mislov has been doing a show called thinking aloud. Now he calls it new thinking aloud for many years. And Sammy Simon of found two has been doing interviews, but somehow, you know, I have my little niece. And uh, an audience to resonate with my way of doing it. And not exclusively, I'm sure they listen to other things. In fact, I have a page on my website listing all the other spiritual interview shows I could find because, you know, the more the merrier. Um, but it just kind of took off mainly, I guess, through word of mouth. Uh, and, you know, we have a, a testimonial page, which is very gratifying to see all the really nice re effects that it's had on people's lives. Um, you know, in some cases, I had, I had a friend who, this is, I don't mean to glorify myself here, if I'll explain it in a second. Um, I had a friend. Actually, Rick, I was, I was going to ask you that question anyway. I'd love to know how your show has impacted people because somebody like Mark Gober has gone on to write five books and reach many, many more people, including myself. Uh, what what are some of the effects of people that have been listening to your show? Well, that, well, that's a friend of mine who, who's been on the show, back Gilbert is his name, and he, he interviewed me one time, uh, and he told the story where he was in Australia for some reason, and he, I, I guess he was on an airplane or something, and he's sitting next to some guy, and the guy found out he was from Fairfield, Iowa. He said, Fairfield, Iowa? You know Rick Archer? And he said, yeah, he's a friend of mine. He said, Rick Archer? You know him? He saved my life. <laughs> and, uh, and so... You know, I've always had a tendency to, uh, Marcy Mad Yogi once called me a collector and a connector. Uh -huh. And I didn't quite know what that meant at the time, but um, I've always had a tendency to like to connect people. I think of myself as kind of a spiritual yenta. Um, and so it really gratifies me to, you know, hear the, the benefits that so many people have derived from, from listening to this stuff. And there are also some beautiful friendships that are formed between people. Um, like, for instance, I interviewed this beautiful poet named Shalane Harkin, some, or Shalane Harkin some time ago. She's like a young Rumi. And then there's this other woman, and she lives in the Pacific Northwest. And then there's this woman named Lucy Grace in New Zealand. And somehow they found each other. And they talk every week now, and, you know, and they're going to do some programs together in, in the States. And then... I interviewed this woman in Sweden and Emily Todd's daughter, and she like um, rescues horses and other animals who would otherwise 
be euthanized and has this whole farm where they, it, she takes care of them and she communicates with them. She's like a, a, a horse whisperer, psychic kind of person. So then she invited these two ladies, Lucy and, and Shalane, to come over to Sweden and do a retreat at her, at her horse farm place. So it, it's kind of cool. I like it when everybody, when these connections take place and people who can enrich each other's lives find each other and I'm able to, you know, facilitate that. That's fantastic. I, I bet, uh, Rick, um, if you're not aware of it, I'll bet you've saved lots and lots of lives because when people are lost and and be and find a, a spiritual pathway, and as a connector, uh, you know, the, the, you make that possible uh, in in a big way. I actually did hear your Lucy Grace interview, um, and it's interesting yeah. that you mentioned animal communication because the last interview I just did was with Kate Solisti, who also thirty years has been uh, communicating with animals. Uh, you know, I just want to say that, I mean, people come to me and they say, oh, it's so fantastic, everything you've been doing. And it may sound like a clear, a spiritual cliche, but I have to reflect and think, have I been doing anything? <laughs> In some sense, I don't, I don't feel like I've been doing anything. And if I have to explain it, I feel like I'm just an instrument, you know, um, which is, you know, there's that St. Francis prayer, prayer, Lord, make me an instrument of thy, of thy peace. Um, and I don't, and I'm, I'm no saint by any means, but I think it's quite another hill, but I have the feeling that I'm just being used and in, in a way that I really feel blessed to be used to bring, you know, more light into the world. But, um, if I'm, if I'm doing anything at all, it's just, I'm, I'm cooperating with, so there's a deeper intelligence that wants to have an influence who wants to be more present, needs to be more present in the collective consciousness of humanity uh, because we're in pretty dire straits. I deeply appreciate what you're saying because uh, I feel exactly the same way. Um, uh, are you familiar with human design at all? I've heard the term, but I couldn't really define it for you. I'm happy to have is a friend of mine. Where he talks about different levels up to 800 or something like that, or is that something else? Uh, I don't know a lot about it. I have a friend who's very talented in Hawaii who does it, um, and I'm happy to introduce you. He, he will he will look at your chart free of charge. Because for years he was telling me when I was doing acupuncture in Beverly Hills, he would come into my office and he'd say, Tara, you're the best acupuncturist I've ever been to, but this is not your human design. And he kept describing to me what my human design is. Uh, and I, I was like, yeah, I know that, except I don't know what that job description is. And so when we ended up doing what I currently do, uh, he's like, yes, Tara, this is your human design. <laughs> so it sounds like it's, it's your dharma or the, that that type of action. Yeah. And, and you, you you mentioned something that was so beautiful. It's like you you almost get out of the way and let spirit move through you. Um, as in the, in the words of the late, great spiritual teacher, Anthony DeMello, you're not the dancer, you're the danced. Yeah. Or in the words of the bumper sticker, let go and let God. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, what, who would you say, and, and uh, I'm, I hope I'm not putting you on the spot here, but, um, you know, there, there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. Um, a lot of people who are, you know, kind of more on the self-aggrandizement path. Um, uh, who would you say out there is really walking their talk and is somebody that you listen to and admire? Is that a fair question? Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure there are a lot of them. One of the first that comes to mind is Swami Sarvapriyananda, who I've been taking classes with for the last several years um, online. And uh, he's, he's very inspiring and the real deal. Um, and there, there's a guy that I've been involved with lately um, named Nipun Vesa. He, he runs an organization called Service Space. And uh, he reached out to me about a month ago and said, how would you like to have a, an AI chat bot for, for Batgap? And I said, yeah, um, so I've been working on that. And he, he's doing all kinds of wonderful things around the world. Um, his organization, um, um, there's so many people that, you know, I mean, Susanna Marie, uh, you know, um, I, I, know, I start thinking of names of teachers and it, and I feel like I'd be unfair to any to the people I don't mention. Pamela Wilson, you know, there's so many who are just 
really sincere and, you know, their teacher role has been gone to their head and they, most of them are operating in a, with a fairly small level of influence. You know, they're not drawing hundreds of people, mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, that in a way that's kind of the pattern these days was that Thich Nhat Hanh said the next Buddha may be the Sangha. And it seems like there's four of a many to many model operating these days rather than a one to many. Mm. Some guru out on of stage with thousands of people in the audience. It's more like small circles. And many of the people in these small circles, you know, consider themselves to be friends more than certainly not gurus, but, you know, they even sometimes arrange the chairs that way if possible, where, you know, everyone is in a circle and we're all in this together. And so, I don't know, you know, I, I'm sure I've omitted, we could spend the rest of the interview looking, naming names and describing people who are worthy of being included in my answer to your question. But those are a few that just came to mind on the spot. Fantastic. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, you recently interviewed uh, Rhonda Byrne and uh, yep. love her. Uh, her her second book uh, or second probably most famous book is The Greatest Secret, which I read right. multiple times. Uh, in that she um, quotes and uh, kind of puts the uh, pointer on a lot of uh, teachers of enlightenment. Uh, and she she uh, many so many of these people say that the truth is closer than your own breath. Can you comment yep. on that? Yeah. Um, well, if God is omnipresent, which God is reputed to be, and by God, I don't mean any kind of isolated being with or without a beard. Um, I mean, all-pervading intelligence, which to me is obvious. I'm walking through a field of wildflowers right now. And if I contemplate, if I think about the little plants that I'm seeing and the cells in those plants, if I could zoom down to the cellular level, I would see a marvel. If you've ever watched one of these videos on YouTube about the inner workings of the cell, it's an incredible the display of, of intelligence. Or you could take it farther down to the molecular or, or atomic or subatomic level. So the whole show, you know, from the, from the tiniest article to, you know, the vastest stretch of galaxies is utterly permeated by intelligence and, and permeated by doesn't quite do it because that implies that there's some gross material that has, you know, intelligence in it, the way a sponge has water in it. It's more like there's only that, that, that intelligence is all there is. And it's self interacting in a way as to give rise to the appearance of leaves and people and turtles and I'm about to see some turtles on my walk. And, uh, <laughs> and everything else. You can, so, you know, we're, in effect, God low men. And we are just... We're losing you a little bit there. Oh, I'm sorry. That was, I, I was saying, um, you could say that God alone is, and we are just sense organs of the divine, sense organs of the infinite. Yeah. And um, so I don't know if I forget what your question was, but I hope I answered it. Uh, yeah, we've got a whole, whole bunch of people fishing, but yeah. I'm going to keep talking. We were talking about the truth is closer than your own breath, which you yeah, gave. Yeah, exactly. You gave it here's a my quote for you. Yeah, here's a good quote from you. Uh, God may be omnipotent, but the one thing he can't do is remove himself from your heart. Mm. Which I think brings us back to the topic of radical forgiveness. Because um, I started to mention my teacher uh, who had gone to prison and ended up getting a pardon because he transformed the whole prison. But whoops, we got some back noise there. Yeah, I just walked through and went to school children and sitting on a bridge. So I, I asked my teacher because I was witnessing something that I thought was incredibly cruel going on in my life. And I was extremely, extremely distraught by it. And I said, how did Jesus say, you know, forgive them for they know not what they do. when these horrible, when these people were doing horrible things to him, and and without missing a beat, he said, because there is no other. Yeah, that's good. I like that. And it, Jesus also said on that, on that same point, I and my father are one, and whatsoever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. Yeah. Um, because there really is no other. And so, you know, people doing horrible things, they're doing it themselves. 
And it takes a great deal of insensitivity to be able to do something cruel, even to, 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 to someone else, when, you're act- and it, when in fact you're actually doing it to yourself and you don't realize it. Beautifully said. Um, so I, I, I just want to ask you a couple more questions and then I'll let you enjoy your beautiful walk. Um, how has the show changed for you over the years? Was, has your, your motivation, the satisfaction, the, the direction, the focus, how has that changed for you over the 14 years and 19 million views? Well, I feel like I've grown a lot um, in, in ways that I probably would have had if I hadn't been doing the show been very um, enlivening to so many different aspects of of my makeup. Um, I can I you know you ever when you were in high school you might have seen a a movie of an amoeba, uh, you know, and the amoeba is moving along, and it it comes to a little speck of food, and it it kind of engulfs the speck of food, and and then it moves on and finds another one. So in a way, every interview feels like a speck of food, and I'm the amoeba. Um, <laughs> it's like I, I really prepare for the interviews. I often read, you know, entire books, even a couple of books sometimes, um, usually while walking in this park, I listen to them. And so I really imbibe, you know, what the people are saying. And even before I interview them, I feel like I've gotten to know them pretty well. And then we have a conversation for two hours. And, you know, and I feel very enriched by that uplifted and uh and then i move on to the next one so it really is kind of a spiritual practice for me in addition to my other spiritual practices um enhanced my life tremendously um and it's cool that i get to do something so fun and don't have to do boring meaningless jobs which i've had to do at times in my life um so it's a blessing i'm grateful for it beautiful love that so um, if you were to go back and talk to Rick Archer when he was 18 years old and you had five minutes to speak to him, what would you say to him? Hmm. Well, if I'm 18, then I'd probably stop taking drugs or nearly have stopped. So, you know, if I caught him even before that, if I caught him at, at, at 12, there's a lot more advice I could give. Okay, then make it, make it 12 then. Not to do. Well, I mean, you know, I was a kid, kid I was, probably psychologically kind of messed up. I wet my bed until I was 12 or 13 years, something like that. And, and then I, I just got into a period of decreasing, increasing sort of degradation as my teenage years progressed. And as I said earlier in the interview, if I, it will look like you think of it this way. If I have another lifetime, which I believe I will, and most people, and most people do, uh, I would love to, to sort of, be in a, I hope I have the, the good fortune to be in a less dysfunctional family, although I, I love my parents and I'm grateful for they did the best they could. But it would be nice to sort of have a really wholesome upbringing and be a really good student instead of an underachiever and, uh, and you know, not and get on to spiritual practice early so I don't have to spend, you know, decades in repair work for all the, uh, traumas I inflicted upon myself and quote was were inflicted upon me in those early years. But you know, having said all that, all is wa- all is well and wisely put. And I think that whatever we go through, ultimately it's for the best. Um everything God does is for the best. You want to hear a quick story on that on that no, absolutely. Okay, so there was this king and he had a chief minister who was considered to be very wise. And, uh, you know, he would always speak the chief minister's advice on everything. And, um, and the chief minister would always advise, would advise other people in the kingdom too. And whatever he told them, he would end up concluding with everything God does is for the best. So sometimes people would come to him whose child had died or something, and they really didn't like hearing that everything God does is for the best. And so some people de- determined to, uh, get the chief minister in trouble. So they waited their opportunity and, one day the king was having a manicure and his finger got cut. And so it had to be bandaged. And, and so these ne'er-do-wells ran to the chief minister and said, oh, the king's finger got cut. 
And he said, eh, everything God does is for the best. So then they ran back to the king and said, hey, your chief minister said this is for the best. And so the king was furious. He said, draw him in jail. <laughs> so then the next day, the king goes out uh, hunting. And he's out in the boondocks. And he gets, uh, he gets captured by these aboriginals or whoever, you know, some people who live out in the, in the boondocks who, who do human sacrifices. So they capture the king, and they're, they're preparing him for the sacrifice. And then they see that his finger is bad. And they say, oh, he's imperfect. We can't sacrifice him. And so they let him go. So the king realizes, oh, my God, it's so good that I have that bad on my finger. And he runs back to the, to the kingdom and runs to the jail and releases the chief minister and says, oh, I'm so sorry. I put you in jail. I was so wrong. Please forgive me. And the chief minister says, hold on. He said, if, if, um, if you hadn't thrown me in jail, I would have gone on the hunting party with you. I always go and do everything with you. And I didn't have a bandage on my finger, so they would have sacrificed me. So you see, everything God does is for the best. Beautiful. I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one more, more quick question. How did you come up with the name Buddha at the gas pump? It's brilliant. It was actually a young friend of mine named Isaac Nevis. And I was thinking of calling it something trite, like awakenings or something like that. And, and I don't know, I couldn't find a, a URL for a web for, that would, that was available with that word like that. And so in this little thoughts on group that I mentioned, I, I asked, well, Hey, everybody, brainstorm on an idea, uh, a name for this thing for me. And so Isaac cooked up, he was in his 20s at the time, he cooked up about, you know, eight or 10 different names. And one of them was Buddha the gas pump. And everybody said, yeah, that's great, do that. And uh, I realized years later that he might have gotten it from that book. Of the, I think it might be the Celestine Prophecy or one of those kind of books where there's some scene where there's this enlightened guy at a gas station. Maybe it's in the way of the peaceful warrior. Maybe that's it. He's at a gas station and he levitates up on the roof. Maybe that's where he got the name. I don't know. But everybody liked it except for my wife. She thought it was a dumb name. Um, and, uh, and what it implies, of course, is that in this day and age, you don't have to be some, you know, holy white robe gay to be enlightened. You might be pumping gas at a gas station and the guy next to you is spiritually awakened. You don't even know it. It looks like an ordinary Joe. It's so, it's uh, a brilliant it's a brilliant title, and you communicate it in such few words. Uh, so kudos on that. So, so <laughs> I don't do anything in few words. <laughs> no, you're doing great, Rick. Uh, I don't think you give yourself <laughs> enough credit. So, uh, in closing, and I'm so grateful that you took us on your walk this morning. But having um, amassed uh, over 100,000 subscribers in 14 years and um, nearly uh, eight. 19 million views. What would you most like to communicate to people uh, in in a sentence or two? Well, that there is really a meaning and purpose to life. And, you know, that we're all here for a reason. And that, you know, that there could be various relative reasons, like we're supposed to be a doctor or this or that. But there's, there's a, an underlying reason, which is spiritual evolution. I think the whole universe is is evolving and we are imbued with that evolutionary impulse being part of the universe. And so in whatever way one conceives of it or can understand it, I think it would be um, beneficial to life to seek deeper truth because there's a, there's a line from the incredible string band, you know, he's probably too young to remember, but they, they were Scottish folk rock band in the 60s and early 70s, which is whatever you think, it's more than that, you know, so whatever one understands life to be or thinks it is or anything else, there's a deeper reality. We're just most part. And that deeper reality is not just a philosophical thing to be to intellectually contemplate. It's something that can be lived as a living experience. We are that reality, ultimately. Um, you know, the Upanishad say, taught Glamasi, thou art that. And uh, if one lived it, then life becomes really enjoyable, very blissful, uh, very full of meaning and purpose. And, um, and it also, and this is more than a sentence, maybe it's a long paragraph with lots of commas and semicolons, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, 
it, it also has benefits to one's relative life. I mean, you end up having, I'm, I'll be seven here in three weeks. You end up having a lot more energy, clarity, creativity, intelligence. It tends to enhance your social relationship. Um, you know, you, you have more heart, more, uh, more love, more ability to behave harmoniously with people. So spirituality is, uh, by spirituality, I don't mean, you know, just some religious thing or anything like that, although that can be one path, but it, it's a bit of a deep experiential development, um, which actually um, the great religious leaders like Jesus and others were talking about. They weren't just saying, believe me or believe this, this concept. They were saying, hey, you, you can, the kingdom of heaven is within. You can have this, this deep experience and it will have a profound influence on your life. So anyway, that's I, what I try to convey to people. I couldn't agree more. And I think you a beautiful description of that. It's like the butterfly effect. Uh, you know, if little baby chicks can influence a random uh, generator robot, then what we humans capable of doing? Yeah. And we're all, like you said before, we're all one. I mean, that's not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And every single one of us sends out ripples of influence constantly, which affects the entire collective consciousness. And, uh, you know, if, if the world has any hope for survival, we need to have more people sending out positive ripples. Beautiful. Beautiful, Rick. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate you including us with your beautiful uh, nature morning walk. Um, I'm so grateful that you joined us here on Next Level Healing and um, hope to stay in touch and connect with you again soon. I love the work that you're doing. Um, uh, I think, uh, again, uh, we need more positive ripples to uh, elevate and have hope for humanity. Yep, I, I think we do. And we're all, we're all doing it. Um, I mean, you, you know, you, it's in our own way, including what you're doing, obviously, and many others. So, and it, so it's... Uh, more, more people can join in the fun <laughs> by, by sort of getting on the evolutionary bus. It's, it is fun. It is yeah. fun. Yeah, it's it's work and it's focus, uh, but it is so worth it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, if you, you got value from this, please click like and subscribe. Um, uh, we're super excited that you're here and uh, we'll see you on the next uh, episode of Next Level Healing. And uh, probably my website is in the show notes, is it? Uh, yeah. Ab absolutely. But if you want to mention it, we're still recording. Please mention it. Oh, it's just batgap.com, B-A-T, like baseball bat, D-A-T, like the clothing store gap, bat gap. It's an acronym for Buddha the Gap Bump, dot com. Absolutely. And it's uh, Rick Archer and Buddha the Gas Pump. Very easy to find online uh, and you won't regret it. <laughs> Thanks for joining okay. us. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Next Level Healing. Please like, subscribe, and let us know how this helped you. How can it be even more life-changing? We love hearing from you. And if you're eager to upgrade your life, click the button here or go to consultterra.com and get your free customized GPS map. Get the coordinates for where you are now and where you want to go. Clients consistently report it's faster and easier than they thought possible. Remember, you were meant for more, and it is available to you. See you right here next week for our next episode.